26, 2014, and we are interviewing Stephen Blickham at the Adams County Courthouse. He is 66 years old, having been born November 23, 1947. My name is Katie Ambler. I'll be the interviewer. Mr. Blickham, could you state for the recording what war and what branch of service you served? I was in Vietnam, uh, 1966 to 69, the U.S. Army. And what was your rank at the time? Uh, Sergeant, B-5. Okay. Um, give us just a little background about where you served. Uh, the f started out in Saigon. I was supposed to be assigned to the 25th Infantry in July, uh, but those orders didn't quite go through, and I ended up in Saigon for six months, and then Long Bend for the last six months. Okay. Where did you do basic training? Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Okay, and from Fort Leonard Wood, um, did you do AIT? Yes, AIT okay. was in Indianapolis, Indiana. Okay, and from there, did you go directly to Saigon? Surprisingly, no. Uh, there was 25 or 30 men in our AIT unit. Mm -hmm. Everybody went to Vietnam, but eight of us went to Chicago, okay. to the 5th Army headquarters. Okay, and how long did you spend in Chicago? We were there a year. Really? Yes. Interesting. Okay. Um, before we get to the to the Vietnam service, tell me just a little bit about what you did in Chicago. I was with the 5th Army Headquarters. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, my MOS was postal, mm. 71 F40, when I got discharged. So I went through postal school. And in Chicago, we did all the mail distribution for the 5th Army Headquarters. Okay. Um, where was most of, I mean, what's passing through Chicago? Is this all the... Uh, international mail? All Everything, actually, no, it was more, I think it was more inner office mail rather okay. than actual stamps on the letter type of mail. Okay. Uh, we did a lot going to the different divisions of the 5th Army. Okay. And how did, you spend a year doing that, mm -hmm. and then how did you end up in Vietnam? Well, we had come down on orders for Korea, all of us. There was eight of us of that original group. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to go to Korea, but they, at the time, they were moving the 5th Army Headquarters from downtown Chicago to Fort Sheridan on the north side. Mm -hmm. So those orders got tanked. Uh, we got a little reprieve. Then when it came time, there was two of us ended up going to Vietnam, and the other six went to uh, Germany. Interesting. Do you remember the names of the eight gentlemen? Uh, some I do. Do you remember the other gentleman that went to Vietnam with yourself? I can't think of his name because we never saw each other again. Okay, so you weren't sent abroad together? No. Okay. That's okay. the bad thing is because it, most groups that went to Vietnam, you went as an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, as compared to World War II, Korea, they went over as units. Mm -hmm. Or even the Quincy National Guard went as a group. Mm -hmm. But you went by yourself. Yeah. When you were in, and obviously you said you were in Saigon. Mm -hmm. And then you went to Chu Lai, and then you went to, uh, did you say Long Bend? I didn't, my orders were for Chu Lai. Okay. But okay. those didn't ever, I never saw Chu Lai. Okay. How long did you spend in Saigon? Six months. Okay. And what did you do when you were in Saigon? It was uh, what they called a post locator with 38th base post office. Mm -hmm. It was, the locator system was all incoming mail going to Vietnam. Interesting came through us if it could not be delivered. Okay. As my order said, I was going to 25th Infantry Division. I never saw it, but my mail went there. Mm -hmm. So it took about a month before I got my first bunch of letters. Mm -hmm. But we would forward all the mail that needed to go. We'd have new addresses for people and then send the mail to them. I see. So you would reroute the mail mm -hmm. to where they were located. Right. Okay. Right. Letters, packages. Mm -hmm. When you ended up in Long Bend, how did you get from Saigon to Long Bend? The entire unit moved. Okay, and which unit was this? The 38th Base Post Office. Okay. So they moved the entire post office? Mm -hmm. Okay. And how many people worked at the post office? Well, there's 26 letters in an alphabet. And the alphabet was divided. I had part of the A's and part of the B's. Interesting. It, it really was. The... Everything was done with IBM cards, oh, the old cards, the old manually. Cards. Everybody had a tray about two foot long of cards, probably five trays a piece. Mm -hmm. 
and you only had sections of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. So there's probably 60 of us. Interesting. Tell us a little bit more about the workings of the post office because this is sort of a something that um, I haven't had. I haven't had the opportunity to talk right. to someone. Tell us a little bit more about what you guys did. Well, when you went to school, you learned to be a postal clerk. Mm -hmm. You know all the things about the stamps, the weights, international mail, and everything for postal. I never touched a letter through a post office. I always worked in either the headquarters mm -hmm. or locator service. Even when I come back from Vietnam, it was still in a locator service. Interesting. Now, you end up in Long Ben and they move the entire post office. How long were you guys stationed in Long Ben? Six months. Okay. I, myself, six months. Okay. And then was that the last post before coming back stateside? Yes. Okay. And the job in Long Ben very similar to the job in Saigon? Exactly the same. Okay. Basically just the building moved location. The facility was better. More okay. room. More room. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, were you able to become immersed in any of the Vietnamese culture when either in Saigon or in Long Bin? Yes and no. I think you just kind of uh, adapt to wherever you're at, what you're doing, who you're with. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I got to Vietnam and Saigon was just two months after the Tet Offensive, so everything in Saigon was still pretty much of a mess. Mm -hmm. Some areas you didn't want to go near. So it took a few months before that settled down a little bit. Then you could do some uh, sightseeing, I suppose is what you might call it. Right. Talk just a little bit more about that. We're talking about the first Tet Offensive? Mm-hmm. Okay. And talk a little bit more about that period of time where you arrived post-Tet. Um, what was the city like a little bit? Not everyone would necessarily know what Saigon would have been like at that time. Give us just a little more um, information about what the city was like. It was quite a while before I went downtown because you pretty much, I stuck pretty close to my unit um, mm -hmm. with friends and family as you'd call them. But, uh, I don't know. There was it was pretty shot up. You could tell where there was a lot of uh, artillery had hit, a lot of damage, and I just more felt sorry for the kids. You know, there was just uh, and there's so many people, so many people in Saigon. Many of them displaced, or I don't know. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I wouldn't know. I mean, there were there are orphanages. Mm -hmm. Because with the packages and that that we would receive that could no longer be forwarded, mm -hmm. you couldn't send them back to the States. And if it contained food still good enough to use, we would take it to the orphanage and then let them have it. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, you said that towards the end of the time in Saigon, you were you know able to get out a little mm -hmm. more. Um, what, what did you do when you were there? I mean, what kind of things did you do? Um, well, one place downtown in Saigon, there was a hotel, and I cannot recall the name of it, but they had a Vietnamese all-girl band mm -hmm. that could sing American songs, couldn't speak an ounce of English. <laughs> I don't know how they did it, but they were good. So I went down, had a few drinks, and enjoyed listening to them. What kind of things were they singing? I want to go home. Uh, that was one of the songs. I can't think of who sang the song, but just a lot of the popular songs that were popular at that of time. The day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, did you have any mementos or anything that you brought back stateside from that time in Vietnam? Not really. Not really. Um, everybody was just so anxious to go home. And some of the guys that were out in the bush would bring things home, you know, that they had, but I didn't bring anything home. What kind of things did people sometimes bring home? I mean, what, what were there popular things to bring home? No, usually it was a war trophy. If somebody had a helmet that might have a bullet hole in it, and he still survived. Uh, I saw those, and then I saw some guns, mm -hmm. the things. As part of the postal unit, did you yourself see any combat? No. Okay. Were there any casualties within your unit? No. Okay. Were there casualties around you? Oh yeah, yeah. I would say some miles away. Uh, you heard about it. 
you knew some there were some casualties, but I didn't witness any. Anybody that you know, though, I mean, were there people that passed through, um, you know, your unit or, you know, that had contact with you through, say, the mess hall or other things that, you know, um, would be part of the next offensive that mm -hmm. would have combat? No, not while we were, not when I was in Vietnam. Was the postal unit fairly insular? Was it, I mean, did you guys spend much time with, um, other, say, infantry troops? No, not, not really. Okay. You, you kind of stayed pretty much in a small group. Okay. Mostly you ate and slept and worked kind of in the same group? Yeah. Okay. Now, I didn't ask, when you got down to Long Bend, did you spend any time in Long Bend doing anything in the city or taking in any of the culture there? No. Long Bend mostly was, if there was a city itself, I didn't know of it. Everything that was supposedly a city was all army, military personnel. Basically, it was a gigantic base. Big base. Yeah. A lot of hospitals, a lot of medevac. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and really, was there, I mean, beyond the base, was there much Vietnamese culture? I mean, was it mostly just the, arm, the army base? Mostly the army base. Well, we did have Vietnamese hired mm -hmm. to uh, door laundry clean up our hooch. Mm -hmm. uh, each one, one mom assigned to maybe have five, I'm guessing. I don't know how many army personnel she took care of. Mm -hmm. And we just paid her to do our laundry, et cetera. Right. They, they took care of the sort of washing and mm -hmm. cleaning and that kind of thing. Right. Okay. Um, what kind of a relationship did you have with those people? I mean, were, did you get familiar with them, or was it really oh, yeah. very business-like? No. Uh, my mama son was probably, I was 20 at the time, so she was probably in her mid to late 40s. Mm -hmm. She just had a job. Mm -hmm. But I always teased her about when it's time to come home, she would come home with me and do my laundry. <laughs> so I had a picture of my house and my car in the snow. So she grabbed my hand and took me to my locker and opened up the door and she said, no, buku cold. <laughs> she was not coming to the States. <laughs> oh, interesting. Was she, um, your, was she the help you had for the entire time you were there? In Long Bend. Okay. And was there a similar person in Saigon? You know, I don't recall a single person. Mm -hmm. she, they might have, might have been, but I don't remember. Yeah. Not as personal. No. Okay. No. Were there a lot of these Mamasans mm -hmm. that worked through the base? Yes. Okay. Um, going back for a second to the, the questions about combat, is there anything, I mean, you were not a prisoner of war, you were yeah. not um, directly in combat, but is there anything that you wish to share about your experiences having you know, been in Saigon a couple of weeks after Tet, or having been um, having combat around you. I was a scared kid. How old were you? Twenty. Yeah. We were nothing but kids. Anyone? Any other? You know, any other impressions of the time dealing with that kind of you know fear or the combat relation? You tried to make good friends which was easy. You picked out the good friends and the other ones you just didn't associate with much. Mm -hmm. So you were like brothers. We tried to make things like family, played a lot of cards, drank an extreme amount of beer, had a lot of fun in our own little family. But as far as going out and becoming part of it, no, didn't really. It was in some of the areas of Saigon. Um, like I said, that ho the hotel around the dock area, I mean, there was a lot of things to see, the embassy, mm -hmm. but it was a mess because that was after Tet. What about it was a mess? Uh, there was a lot of bullet holes everywhere. Yeah. Um, you were never part of anything that would have involved battle planning? No. Okay. All right. Um, do you have any medals or citations or commendations? From I just time? have the Army, uh, Army Commendation Medal. Um, you've talked a little bit about how you got along with the soldiers and officers um, in, within your group, your home group. 
Um, what about the, you know, sort of the higher ups, the brass, the other people? We really didn't have a lot of association with them. We had our XO, which is was a lieutenant, and then our CO. That was basically it. Other officers, you just, we were in our group. Uh, I didn't have a lot of uh, interaction with them. Your function as this, you know, postal unit mm -hmm. um, didn't require, assume, much other contact with the higher-ups? No. Okay. As long as it ran, they sort of left you alone? They did leave us alone. Okay. <laughs> um, did you feel the pressure or the stress of the times that were around you? At first. Then you just learn to adapt. Tell me how you adapt. I think you just accept things as they are and try to do what you can. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain. It's, you're put into a situation. You learn. Uh, it's kind of hard to say you did one certain thing. Like I said, you made good friends. With those good friends, did you discuss what was going on, or was the goal to um, make life as normal as possible? As normal as possible. You get through the day. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do tomorrow after work? Are we going to drink beer? Are we going to drink whiskey? Are we going to play cards? Right. But we played a lot of basketball. We had a, a hoop that we put up. Mm -hmm. We played football, which sounds kind of crazy, but <laughs> you just do something to make life normal. Mm -hmm. When it was abnormal, then you just adapted to that. Were there things that were unusual um, in terms of you guys had a sort of a unique job because you're you're basically transporting letters and packages and information um, from you know within the army. Right. Um, what were there unusual things that occurred because you guys were in that position of having to? you know, send things to people who had been put in harm's way or um, things that couldn't be delivered, as you said. Or, I mean, were there those issues? The non-delivery was kind of tough because you wanted to get things to them. I mean, that letter's important. Yeah. Um, we made every, every, every effort to make sure it got where it belonged. Mm -hmm. But for the things that were perishable where you could not forward Many times, somebody would be wounded within the first month and go home. So then you had all the incoming letters and everything going back, and the packages, I said, we, it was worthwhile. We just took them to the orphanage. Everything else got thrown away. Um, did you keep a diary or a journal during the time? No. I still have all my letters from my parents. Interesting. How often did you receive letters from your parents? Every day. They wrote. That's amazing. Did you write that many letters home? Short. You know, just something to say I'm okay. But daily as well? Every day. Does your, do, you, do you have those letters? Mm -hmm. So you actually have all of your letters and all, all of my, their letters? I don't have theirs because I didn't bring them home with me. Uh -huh. But I have all the ones that I sent home. Uh -huh. But <clears throat> my mother would start a letter in the mornings. And my dad would finish it when he'd get home from work. They would mail it every single day. We did voice tapes back and forth. Voice tapes? Yeah, reel to reel. Reel to reel? <laughs> I wish we had what everybody has today. Oh, absolutely. With emails, etc. Exactly. Yeah. Do the reel to reels exist? Yeah, I hope they haven't melted because they've been in a, up in the attic. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we still have them. How fascinating. Um, what are a couple of your most memorable experiences from your time? Getting off the plane in Benoit Air Base, stepping off of a 78 degree airplane to what felt like an oven with distinct smells and odors, walking from the aircraft uh, across the tarmac, and by the time I got under the the area where they gathered, my clothes were soaking wet from sweat. But it was April, leaving Quincy, Illinois, going to, I don't know what the temperature was. It felt like 120. And then just the opposite end of that, getting on that airplane to go home. That was good. Mm -hmm. Explain a little bit about the smell. 
getting there? It's hard to explain. It's kind of musty. Because um, when you got into Saigon, you're right along the Saigon River. And there's more than one or two people hanging around. So you have millions of people, it seems like, all in these little huts mm -hmm. along the river. It just had a distinct odor to it. Mm -hmm. You learn to adapt, and I didn't realize it after a short time. It no longer made a smell to you. No. Yeah. And the heat during your time, and, and let me back up a second. We've talked about Long Ben. We've talked about Saigon. You mentioned Benoit. Where does Benoit, was that? The Tonsonut Air Base is associated with Long Ben. Benoit Air Base was associated with Saigon. Okay. There were two air bases. Right. Okay. That makes that that helps us get a little bit better right. um, chronology. Um, talk a little bit more about getting on the plane, going home. Let me back up to when I got off the plane. Okay. For one moment. Sure. It was kind of somber. Everybody was really quiet. Nothing said. And you just saw the happy faces on the other guys that were going to get on that airplane that you just got off of. We weren't too happy. <laughs> so getting on the plane to go home, I was in with that other group. A big smile on my face, and I felt so bad for those people coming in. And it did cross my mind how many are going to go back home. Because you just don't know. Did you have anything that you kept um, that symbolized to you good luck? A rosary. You brought it from home and you took it mm -hmm. home with you. Okay. Anything else? Not that I brought up for any good luck. I think that um, I really believed it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today's my mom's birthday. I'm sorry. I didn't want to do that. But her letters. No, her I'm letters. Good. Go ahead. But she wrote every day. Yeah. Never missed. It's incredible, really. <clears throat> incredible. And especially to someone who worked in the postal unit. How amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how 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 incredibly um um yeah. With respect to the postal unit and, and really just your time there, did you have all the supplies that you needed? Did they did they supply everything, clothes and food and everything that you needed? Yeah, we didn't have any problem there. Things arrived on schedule? Seemed to. I don't recall, uh, you know, having a problem with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was your experience with the food? <laughs> <laughs> we worked nights, which made it wonderful. It was cooler, and if Charlie was going to throw in some mortars at 1 a.m. like he normally did, we almost were on our way to the bunker because it was like clockwork. Mm -hmm. But it was a little more difficult trying to sleep during the day. Sure. But, you know, everything that we had, I mean, the food was fine. My mom and dad would mail stuff to me, goodie bags. Like what? Spam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fabulous. My wife will kill me for saying that. But, <laughs> Beans and weenies, just things that just, wow, you didn't get that. That you didn't receive. Uh -huh. Back up just a second for a little clarification. What's a Charlie? Uh, Viet Cong. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. We just want to make sure that the people understand. So, um, and and basically what you're talking about is shelling on a schedule. Yes. Right. Okay. They would throw mortars or rockets. I think it was just an irritation and they were having fun doing it. So <laughs> it didn't irritate me. <laughs> But how often did you, you know, get up to shelling? Or how often were you dealing with shelling? Sometimes it seemed like every night. Okay. Uh, that's why I say you could almost set your watch by between that and the rain. Mm -hmm. it would, you'd set your watch. 1 a.m. was going to start raining and Charlie would throw a few mortars at you. Really? Was it a very, was it an incredibly rainy climate there? During the monsoon season. Which is when? I got there first part of April, and they hadn't seen rain since before December. And then it started, and I, 
as I recall, it must have lasted about four to six months. But it wasn't constant. It was a hard, heavy rain, and then quit and go away, and then be hot. Incredibly hot. Yes. And Very really humid. humid. Very humid. Yeah. Um, in terms of the food, what do you recall about it? Powdered eggs. <laughs> what else? Powdered milk. And beer. No. <laughs> <laughs> beer took care of everything. <laughs> the food really, they did well. The, the guys really did good. I do recall, and I believe it was in Saigon, our XO went down to the docks and went to a ship. I don't want to hear the stories about it, but somehow he came back with ribeye steaks. Mm, interesting. And we had a good picnic. And that was probably the only steaks I had the entire time there. Mm -hmm. What kind of, what's, what was the first meal when you hit the States? No idea. Oh, when I hit the States? Yeah. When I got home, my mother had made me cherry cheesecake for dessert, and I hadn't slept in three days. I passed out sound asleep and missed the meal. <laughs> I was on the living room floor. Just, I said, I'm just resting my eyes, and I didn't wake up till the next day. I had cherry cheesecake for breakfast. I was going to say, I'm sure you had cheesecake yes. for breakfast. <laughs> um, you talked a little bit about what you guys did to entertain yourself, play cards, mm -hmm. um, you know, go down to the docks or go to the show and listen to the to the ladies sing. What other kind of things did you do um, for free time to kind of keep? We had an, an EM club, which is an enlisted man's club. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was an officer's club somewhere. But there was guys that would play in bands. Uh, I played a harmonica. And a friend of mine in my unit played guitar, and he and I would just sort of jammed together. I wasn't any good, but he was, so he made me sound good. <laughs> so, I mean, I played that a lot, and we just entertain ourselves a lot of times. Did you guys ever have professional entertainers oh, visit yeah. you? Yeah, okay. Bob Hope. Okay. Saw him in person. Interesting. Did you, know? you get a chance to meet him? No. Okay. What show did he do? Where was he when you he did He was in show? Long Bend. Okay. He came to Long Bend. So it would have been Christmas of 1968. And he had with him a group called Honey LTD, Ann Margaret, Rosie Greer, the football player. Mm -hmm. There was another group. At that time, that was the largest troupe that he had come with him. Mm -hmm. and it, it was a good show. Oh, so talk about the show. It, it's Well, of course, the girls were very nice. But... <laughs> His, I mean, the groups, they danced and they sang. It just made you feel, you kind of forgot where you were at. And then the other one, I heard about it late in the day, but it was James Brown. He was there entertaining, again, that was on Long Bend. And I think four or five of us went. And we stood in water to watch his show, and he put on a good show. It was right after a monsoon. <laughs> But it was good. He was, and I bumped into him at St. Louis. Really? Going for our physical mm -hmm. when I was going in the army. Uh huh. I physically bumped into him. 1966. 66. Yeah. And what was he? How did you run into him? I, we were there was three of us, and we were just talking. And of course, I was paying no attention where I was walking, and he was getting out of his limo, and I physically ran right into him. <laughs> nice man. He was a really nice guy. And he put on a good show. Excellent. So how often did you and your friend entertain? Oh, two or three times a week. But we just sat in our bunk and in our hooch, mm -hmm. just jamming. Explain what hooch is. Please? Explain what you mean by a hooch. Oh, that's uh, like a barracks. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Um, <clears throat> did you ever have any time when you were actually on leave over there? No. I had no leave in country. I did right. take R&R. &R. Okay. And what did you do on R&R? &R? Went to Sydney, Australia. And the choices were Sydney for seven days, Hawaii for seven days, Bangkok, Hong Kong. There was Taipei, Taiwan. I think you could have gone to. Those were all five days. Mm -hmm. My choice was Sydney because I was at the bottom of the world and I probably would never get a chance to see it again. And I thought... Eventually, I'd maybe get to Hawaii. Right. Sydney was beautiful. 
and everybody was so nice. I had a great time. I would love to see it again. Mm -hmm. Where did you go? Just to the city? I stayed on the north side of Sydney on Bondi Beach mm -hmm. for three days. And then my buddy and I that I went with, we decided to go downtown and stay in a hotel, mm -hmm. downtown Sydney. Interesting. What did you guys do while you were there? No, I, we drank a lot. But we had a good time. Had a vacation. It, it was a vacation. Yeah. Spent some time on the beach. Mm -hmm. The year that I was there, which would have been in October of 68, the opera house in Sydney was almost completed. Mm -hmm. Then when I got home, Carol Burnett had a show from that opera house. Interesting. But within the week that I, after I got out. After you left. Yeah. Interesting. Um, do you have any recollections of anything you found particularly humorous or unusual during your time in Vietnam? Nothing strange that, that I can caught you as strange. <laughs> <laughs> we would sit out at night after work, still in the middle of the night, and drinking a few beers, talking, thinking about home. And you could see off in the distance where firefights were going on. And you would see the tracers going down to the ground, and then you just kept thinking, I've got it made compared to those guys. Mm -hmm. Felt very safe mm -hmm. because of them. Right. Did you guys pull pranks on each other? I, I'm sure we did. I can't think of anything in particular other than short sheeting a bed. And what short sheet? You would get into your bed, you would fold the sheets about that far down to make it, you start to put your feet in the bed, you couldn't get them in there. <laughs> so you had to take the whole thing apart to make it so you could get in the bed. But most of the times you would sleep on top of a sheet. And it was so hot a lot of day, well, especially during the day, but you would spray yourself down with water and then I'd have an oscillating fan above me to keep cool. And then you'd wake up because it was so hot and you'd do it all over again. Yeah. What you guys, as you said, slept during the day. Was it difficult to get used to the work all night, sleep all day schedule? Yeah, but you get tired enough that you adapt pretty quick. Mm -hmm. What was going, I mean, were you aware of what was going on during the day around you a little bit? Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. It was noisy. Noisy. Mm -hmm. And uh, hot. Very hot. And I think I was in the center of five medevac hospitals. So helicopters were flying over all day long. Where was the postal unit in relation to these um, medevac hospitals? We were probably centralized in the middle of Long Bend. Mm -hmm. And Five medevac hospitals, for those who don't know, means how many choppers coming in and out? I couldn't count them. Yeah. When I used to do the voice tapes to my parents, I would just say, well, wait just a second, and the chopper would fly over. Then I'd continue the conversation. Got to the point where I would just shut the mic off and wait. And my dad, being the blessed man that he was, he sent in a letter one time, did you ever think about one of those being shot up and falling on you? Not until he said <laughs> that. Not until you mentioned I it. I did never thought of it. <laughs> Hadn't occurred to me until now. <laughs> so I kind of got on him pretty good about that one. Were you aware of what they meant? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. When I left, so my dad had black hair. Very dark. When I came back, it was gray. And you were gone three years, two one. and a half years. Well, one year in Vietnam. Right, but 66 to 69 total. Right. Um, you talked about getting on the plane. Do you remember the day that you were discharged? Yes, from the Army. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, talk to me about that. Raining. Day. I had gone, got all the paperwork all completed, and my last duty was to turn keys in to the facility that I worked in and it was raining there was no celebration I got in the car and drove home in the rain smiling all the way mm -hmm. at the time that you came home um, the war was still going on 
Um, so, how did you feel about leaving when the military action was still ongoing? It probably would have been more difficult had I gone over, like our National Guard unit went over as a group mm -hmm. with friends. Mm -hmm. uh, their family basically was already established. The whole year that I was there, somebody was always coming and somebody was always leaving. So you were kind of in that rotation frame of mind all the time. Everybody had a countdown calendar and you would X every day until it was time to go. <clears throat> I hated leaving friends, but I was so glad to leave. But the fact that you were, I mean, you know, and correct me if I'm mistaken this, but the fact that you were essentially sent as an individual mm -hmm. helped the leaving because it was a rotation. Is I that right? So. I think so. Okay. Um, so in terms of the people that you knew, were there any others that were discharged with you at the same time? No. What did you do, and let me stop for just a second, did you bring any photographs or anything that you wish to talk to us about today? I don't have photographs, I do have a shadow box that my wife made for me a few years ago. Okay. Um, we took a photograph yes. of it and it's part of, it'll be part of your record. Okay. Um, do you want to hold it up and talk to us just a little bit about what's in it? I don't know how. Oops, it's going to fall apart. Okay. Can you see that? Um, if you will pull it just a little closer to the... Because it's upside down. Okay. <laughs> There's that too. Yeah. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Okay. Actually, will you pull it back just a little bit? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to pull this back just a tiny bit. Okay, would you just go through with us real quickly what we see? Well, my dog tags naturally. Uh, right below that is a label of what they call Bom Ni Ba, which is a Vietnamese beer. And I don't mean to make it sound like that's all I did, but uh, that was the Spec Force patch that I had. This was the newspaper article when I came back. My Army Commendation Medal is at the bottom with my sergeant stripes. This patch below that is a USRV patch, which is United States Army Republic of Vietnam. Some bullets, and then this one is what is MPC, military money. It looks like Monopoly money, and below here is Vietnamese money. And once again, this is Vietnamese beer. They called it Bom Ni Ba, which, is, which means 33. And this beer label here is from Sydney, Australia. What's That's about next it. to the Australian, um, in between the bullets and the Australian beer label? This one here? Or right above that? Right there. That was the army pin that was on top of my hat. Okay. Okay. Um, just a couple of things. How did you come to have the bullets? Actually, those are not from the military. Oh, okay. Those are, those are from my father-in-law's ammo. <laughs> okay. All right. From many years ago. Okay. Okay. Anything else we want to make sure we cover? I don't see anything. I mean, there's... A nice collection of things. A collection. Put together. She did a yeah. nice job. She really yeah, did. Very nice. Right. Okay. Yeah. Let me get, make sure I get you back in the frame. Once you were discharged, what did you do in the days and weeks after being discharged from service? I think it was a week before I was able to go to work, and I went right back to work in mm -hmm. Motorola. Tried to go back to being a civilian. Okay. It was really easy. <laughs> and was this a job that you held before you went yes. to service? Okay, so you actually went back to a similar job or a similar position? I went to basically the same thing. Okay, same company? Yes. Um, did you ever use the GI Bill or did you ever go back to school? I took some accounting courses. Mm -hmm. Through the GI Bill? Through the GI Bill. Okay. Um, and what did you use the accounting courses for? I never used them. Okay. I just wanted to do something, but I ended up going to the post office mm -hmm. and worked there for 40 years and 10 months. Which post office? Quincy. Okay. Um, 
where do you keep track of any of your old friends? My best friend died uh, the day I moved into my house that we built. His wife called and said he had passed away and had a brain tumor. Sorry. His doctor said he had had that for a long time, so he had a brain tumor while we were there. Oh, really? The other two other good friends were on the coast. I kept track of one who just recently passed away within the last three months. Uh, the one in Florida, it's the problem that they don't go as a unit. They're all over the place. Yeah. But I tried to contact him. I kept up with one in California for a while. Mm -hmm. Then we just lost track. Yeah. You kept up with them for how long after service? Sounds like uh, for a while. Yeah, quite a while, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Do you ever do any type of reunions? Do you ever go back to any of that kind of stuff? As an individual, you, it's really hard to do. We talked about getting together in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in 69. We talked about getting together maybe at 75 or 80. Mm -hmm. We just all lost touch. Yeah, life sort of takes over. I looked, We were. my wife and I were in Orlando, Florida, which is where my good friend was from. I looked up in the phone book when we were there, found his name, Dennis Jenkins. I called to talk to this gentleman's wife, and I asked, well, do I have the right Dennis Jenkins? Was he in Vietnam in 1968-69? Yes. Was he in Long Bend, Saigon area? Yes. I called up and it wasn't him. Oh. Exact same name. We were there at the same times. What a, a, what a strange coincidence. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So I have no clue what happened to my friend. <laughs> right, right. But I found another one. You found someone else. <laughs> um, do you have, I mean, have you joined any kind of veteran organization? I haven't. I was going to join the VFW and I procrastinated and haven't. The only thing that I really joined is the Patriot Guard. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, there's a funeral tomorrow to ride. We do the honor flights, Absolutely. and I really, truly enjoy that. Yeah. It's impressive. Yeah. What other kind of things does the um, Patriot Guard do besides the honor flight and the funerals? Mostly that's about it. Mm -hmm. you but know, do you guys have meetings? No. Okay. It's all volunteer, and it's, you don't have to be a veteran. Mm -hmm. You just have to want to be part of it. You don't have to have a motorcycle. It doesn't <laughs> have to be a Harley, right. although that's the better one. But <laughs> <laughs> For the most part, you know, it's just Patriots. And I think all of that has come since 9-11. Interesting. Have, um, has your service experience affected your life? Oh, absolutely. Okay. How do you know it has, has affected you? Between 1969 and 9-11 of 01. Not really. Just it's something that I did. It's in the past. It's over. Mm -hmm. It was a long time ago. But since 9-11, there's a lot more patriotism for everybody. Has anyone ever thanked you for your service? They do now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how does that make you feel, being thanked for service? It's nice. It is nice. And in reality, it's almost too bad that service, Peace Corps, or some sort of service-oriented isn't mandatory. It really makes you grow up in a hurry. And it probably do this country a lot of good. Did your military experience affect the way that you think about military service or war generally? Uh, the participants that are in the military, I back them 100%. And I hate seeing things get cut constantly, constantly. And the military first. Mm -hmm. That's the wrong one. <laughs> To make cuts. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the individuals, yeah, I'm, I'd be very proud to be amongst any of them. Does it? Did the service make you view your government the same way that you did before service, or has it affected your view on government? Uh, before service, I had never even thought about it. Mm -hmm. I was 19 years old, 18 years old. I never thought about it. I was too busy thinking what I was going to do the next night or the next day. 
and even afterwards, um, even when I was in Vietnam, I never thought about the government. But looking back at history, now I do. Mm -hmm. How does it make you, I mean, what? how do you feel about it now? We have 535 members of Congress that send kids to war to die. Are you someone who watches war movies? Not much. Yeah. I've seen a few. Uh, typically Vietnam or typically World War II or Korea or? Nothing in particular. Okay. The ironic thing is we had a little theater. I believe it was in Long, yeah, it was in Long Bend. We had a tent and we would get old movies mm -hmm. and they would bring movies in. But the Green Beret movie with John Wayne. I was in Vietnam watching John Wayne and looking <laughs> off in the distance and watching mortar rounds going off or tracers. <laughs> Very ironic. Yeah, surreal. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Hmm. Um, obviously, that one was at an interesting time yes. in your life. But the ones that you've seen having come home. Do you feel like they accurately depict what you saw, or do you feel like they're a little off when it comes to, you know, service and war? A lot of the movies that you see about Vietnam, World War II, I wouldn't know, but with Vietnam, I'd probably not be the right person. It's somebody that was in the bush and had to fight to stay alive every day. They could tell you if it was pretty real or not. I'm, yeah. I'm sure some are. Um, do you have the opportunity to know what they're talking about in terms of war and history in schools today? Do you have any contact with anyone who's no. learning, you know, kind of that era today? No, not really. I've been invited by nephews to go to like a Veterans Day function at their school. Okay. But as far as, you know, talking to them about any of it, not really. Okay. Um, it's pretty common, and this may or may not be true for you, um, for certain era veterans to not want to talk about their service all that much. How do you feel about talking about your time in Vietnam? I don't, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. Mostly because I wasn't in the bush. Um, I didn't see a lot of the things that some of these kids had to see and live through, be part of. Mm -hmm. So I could see where they wouldn't want that to come back. Mm -hmm. What's the most positive thing you think came for you from your time in service? Well, I think I matured a lot. Um, you have a lot of respect for your friends close friends. You make close friends. Keep them close. Because <laughs> uh, we leaned on each other. You know, my best friend was probably my mother, my dad, my brother, my cousin, and everything to me. And I think you feel like you were the same thing to others. It was a good, tight-knit family group. What's probably the one thing that you felt was sort of negative? The war itself. No reason to be there. Was that part hard? Hmm. Yeah. Was it something that was difficult with the people that you associated with too? Was there a lot of... I, not the people that I associated there. Okay. Because you didn't, you didn't dwell on it. It was just a daily job, a daily survival, whatever. But mm -hmm. You're there, you get every day done, and go home. Mm -hmm. I even said that on R and R. A couple of the locals were talking about Vietnam, and I said, "I'm just trying to do my time and go. That's all I want to do. I have no interest in talking politics about it, why we're there, what we're doing. I just I'm here to have a good time. Now I'm going home. I'm here to do a job. Yep. Okay. How did you feel when you returned home about how the country dealt with it? But that's kind of a mixed bag. You know, I was not embarrassed that I went, but I wasn't going to be showy that I had just returned. I was kind of bitter at those that 
dodged the draft. Um, but it was really easy to just kind of put that behind me and move on. Mm -hmm. Return to the Motorola and yep. day at a time. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, where did you Where did you grow up? In Quincy. Okay. And when you returned to work for Motorola, you were where? Same house. Okay. Living with my parents at the time. Okay. So for you know for your sort of childhood pre-military, you were Adams County. Yes. Okay. And you returned to Adams County. Yes. Do you feel like that there was any change in Quincy or Adams County during the time that you were gone? The year that I was gone, there were a lot of positive changes. I mean, I think there was a lot of construction that had gone on and things had changed in that light. But as far as the people, not really. Very welcoming. Yeah. Came home to feel like you were welcome. Yeah. There was Back nothing. to the same. Back to the same old groove. How'd your family feel to have you home? <laughs> Happy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> probably happy to not have to write no the more letters, letter right? Yes. <laughs> they were probably more happy. letter writing. Yeah. Um, I want to be sure that we've talked about all the things that you want to cover. Um, are there other things that you want to be sure that we add to this um, interview? I really can't think of any. I'm glad they're doing this. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be very interesting to hear others. Uh, we, you know, you talk to different guys that were, whenever I see someone wearing a Vietnam hat, I always ask them, what year were you there and where? Surprisingly, how many times you find people there at the same time and in the same general area. Mm -hmm. There, there was a lot of times where we would be in Long Ben and would, wanted to go to Saigon just for a day to give yourself something to do. Mm -hmm. And rather than hitchhike, we would go to the heliport, sign our name, and if a helicopter was heading that direction, they'd take you and drop you off. Yeah. Same way coming home. It was just like a taxi cab. You could just catch a ride. Catch a ride. <laughs> when you were going into Saigon for something to do, what were you doing? What did you guys go in for? A lot of times we go back to a good PX mm -hmm. that had other things, uh, good stereos or cameras or good price on anything. Uh, the PX in Cholon was known for being good. Um, I had one occasion there, probably my closest brush with my mother's prayers keeping me alive. Outside the PX was an MP. They would have a 55 gallon drum where when you went into the building, you would clear your weapon. You would take the clip out, pull the trigger to make sure there was nothing in the chamber. You'd be pointed into that bucket of sand. And one gentleman was not happy that he had to do that. I have no idea why. But he cleared his weapon and pointed at my head and went click. So, mom. <laughs> yeah. Bless mom. Yeah. Um, for the record, spell to, uh, Sholon. Sholon, yeah. C H O L O N. Okay, all right. Thanks. And just to clarify, Chulai is C H U L A I. It's two words, C H U L A I. Right, with a dash between U yes. and the L. Okay. Yes. Long Ben, L O N G B I E N. B I H N. Wait, B I H N, I apologize. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any of the other places you were that I would make, would make sure we want to get Saigon spelled? should be Saigon spelling right. okay. Yeah. Um, other stories, things that caught you as strange, stories that you tell your you know, nephews or things that you remember, either would... fondly or <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, right? Other than R&R, &R, you know, meeting some pretty good people there. We were warned when we went on R&R &R in Sydney, they had a rallies, anti-war rallies in the Central Park, mm -hmm. and we were told to stay away from there, mm -hmm. which I did. But I met two gentlemen to try to get me to go you know, and talk about the war, et cetera. And those are the two people that I said earlier that said, I'm not interested. I don't want to talk about it. I'm here to have a good time. Then I'm going home. And then from then on, the rest of the night, they bought me drinks and we're just as nice as nice could be. But they tried. But they tried. Yes. <laughs> anything else? I can't think of anything right off again. 
any other stories you tell your, you know, friends, the things that come up. When you have thoughts of that time or feelings about that time, you know, any other things that come to mind for you? Music was good. Talk about that for a minute. What do you mean? I just liked the music of the 60s. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was anti-war stuff, but still, I liked a lot of the music. Mm -hmm. um, you played some and you listened yeah, to Yeah, we played and a little. And I, we wrote, I wrote a letter to WGEM, which is the radio station in Quincy. Mm -hmm. The disc jockey's name was Bob Joy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's still around, but they had a um, radio program called Teen Time. And they would play the popular music. Mm -hmm. So I sent a letter to him asking if he would record one of those evenings of the teen time. Mm -hmm. And he sent it to me. Wow. It was it was really neat. It was really neat. So he sent you a broadcast. He sent me a broadcast of teen time on reel to reel tape. Interesting. Where were you when you did this? Probably in Long Bend. Uh -huh. I think that means a while into the my tour. So it would have been 68, 69? Uh, it could have been 69, yeah. early 69 or late 68. Early, late, late 68, early right. 69. Okay. That's really But he announced it. He was recording, you know, for, for, you. for me. Uh -huh. And then other guys started doing that too. So we had mine from Quincy, one from Los Angeles, KGFJ, I think was the mm -hmm. call letters. Mm -hmm. So each one of us had one. Oh, how, that's, that's it was amazing. Neat. What a, what an interesting, what a good idea. Yeah. Well, the radio station, which was Armed Forces Radio, mm -hmm. and I know I'll get his name wrong, but I think the gentleman's, the disc jockey's name was Roger Kugenauer. He was the story behind the show Good Morning Vietnam. Okay. And he, <laughs> he was the DJ. And my best friend, whose bunk was right across from mine, my radio would be playing from being on all night, but there's no sound until 6 a.m. when Mr. Kugenauer would get on and say, good morning, Vietnam. So my buddy would take his boots and throw them at my radio, <laughs> <laughs> telling me to tell it to shut up. Yeah. So that's one. You know. yeah, yeah, exactly. Interesting. Anything else? I can't think of it now. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure. And... Thank you very much for Thank your you. service. Thanks for doing this. Bye. Oh, it's my 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 pleasure. So all right.